Quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. So I've been thinking about the episode this week, what we're going to be talking about, and it reminds me a little bit of the analogy of the Academy Awards are our Super Bowl. <laughs> I was trying to think of what would be the equivalent of this, and I think it would be maybe four days on a beach or four days in Paris or... But for us, it's four days of watching <laughs> movies, going to lectures, and hearing all about old Hollywood. Exactly. And, and what we're talking about today is the Turner Classic Movies Film Festival, which Nan and I will be covering as part of the media, which, which we're so very excited exciting. about. We're yeah. so excited. We're very excited. <laughs> now, the dates are, just so we get this off the top, April 18th through the 21st, and it is the 15th annual TCM Film Festival. Yes. And you know, and, and I cannot talk about the film festival without talking about Bob Osborne, mm. um, which I don't know if, if people know, but um, I was friends with Bob. I met Bob um, probably the early 1990s through um, my friend Al Morley and my great friend Billy Barnes. And Bob and I just hit it off immediately. I Gee, think, I can't imagine uh, <laughs> what you would have had in common. <laughs> oh, we were, you know, two peas in a pod. And, you know, and I so admired his love and knowledge of old movies and how he so cared about the legacy of um, old Hollywood and these films. And I think that's what really connected us and bonded us. And every time Bob would be in Los Angeles, and it was so much fun, and I miss it to this day. He would just call up and say, "Hey, kiddo, I'm coming by. Let's 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 go for a ride." And I would jump in the car, and usually Al would be there or Billy or somebody, and we would take these great Bob Osborne tours of Los oh, Angeles. My Gosh. And he would show you where all the things happened. He would show you where Pick Fair used to be and, you know, where, you know, Susan Hayward had a fight with Lex Barker and, and the house <laughs> where, you know, so-and-so was murdered. I mean, it was the most incredible wow. tours. And I'm just so grateful. I look back on it now as, you know, a little older. And, and I'm so appreciative of that care he took in yes. wanting to impart that knowledge to me. Yes. And it's one of the reasons that I probably did my blog is because now I feel the responsibility. I want to share that. the knowledge. I yes. want to pass the torch to the next generation right. of, of, you know, keep these movies and these people alive. And as much as we love the TCM hosts that are currently... And we do. We do. We really miss Robert Osborne. His insights, yes. his encyclopedic knowledge of film and stars and... He was born for that role. Yeah. He really was. He really was. Yeah. Well, then let's do this as a little homage to him. I was going to say, a little tribute to Bob, and I, I'm so grateful that I had that tutelage from the great Bob Osborne. Yeah. And I'm so excited to cover the festival, us as an entity for from beneath the Hollywood sign, and we're going to give you guys a preview of what's coming up at the festival. Right. Let's start with a little overview, um, because there are some films that are newer, and there are, of course, some films that are classics, and some that are older that we haven't seen. So. Yes. Just as an overview, one of the things that stood out for me in going over the schedule is a harpy still. Jodie Foster <laughs> is getting her hands and feet in um, the Chinese yes. theater, and there'll be um, a presentation of that. Yes. As well as a screening of Silence of the Lambs, and she will be a guest post uh, the screening. I know that's that's pretty exciting. It'll be fun to cover that. Yeah. You know, we all love Jodie Foster and, and well, but I have to say when I saw that Silence of the Lambs was being shown at the classic cinema, oh I felt really old. I know, I know. <laughs> like, gonna, I, I remember exactly where I was when I saw that movie. Yes, and that wasn't yes. that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. In fact, my mom is a real horror film fan. <laughs> she loves to be scared. I don't know if she still does, but but she did back then. And we she was out here visiting and the two of us went 
went to see Silence of the Lambs in the theater and just about oh, had heart attacks. Scared the bejesus oh out gosh. of me. <laughs> it's the only film that has won Best Picture that's a horror film. Yeah, that's true. And that's of course, true. Jodie Foster, I think we all know, has been nominated multiple times, has won two Oscars, and started her career, I believe, at the age of two, doing commercials, and really has been in the business the she whole was, time. She was the copper tone baby, yes. where the dog is pulling her diaper yes. off, and you see her little booty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a there's a great uh, interview that Scott Feinberg does of her recently after Nyad, and um, she's had a really fascinating career. Yeah, amazing, talented. We well, you know what I'm excited about is the theme of this. Yes. The theme of this year's uh, festival is most wanted crime and justice in film. Ooh. Because if you guys know me, I like crime. He likes I the like, dark. I like the dark. I like the murders. I like the investigation. So yes. they're doing a little tribute to that. And there's some great films they're showing to sort of go along with the theme. But to kick off the festival, the opening night movie is, again, a movie that I'm not sure is a classic yet, but yes. they're showing Pulp Fiction. Yes. And John Travolta will be there, Samuel L. Jackson, Uma Thurman. So that's going to be really fun. Can I tell you my little story about Pulp Fiction? When yeah. I went, again, uh, I feel really old because I was there when, <laughs> when we went to see a screening of it. In the scene where Eric Stoltz and John Travolta are trying to bring back Uma Thurman from her overdose. <laughs> and they have the syringe of adrenaline that they're going to put into her heart. I <laughs> don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> yes, don't try. I almost vomited in the theater. Ooh. I had to take off my sweatshirt that I had on. I started to sweat. I was just, it was, it was awful. Oh, my gosh. Um, See, what? again. I am the dark, you are the light. <laughs> yes, well, the horrible darkness of that made you vomit. Yes, right. And I would have been like, show me. I want to see <laughs> yes, the syringe going see in the, the heart. Thing. <laughs> the other thing that I noticed in their schedule is that they have a pop quiz like we have. Well, isn't that something? How about that? And you can join a team and you can, if you, it's called So You Think You Know the Movie. So this, this, I think, I have a feeling you're going to, ah. if, if you were at this, you would, you would win the big we prize. We all love a good trivia night. Yeah, we do. Well, you know, another thing they're doing, and, and I'm excited about this because it's, he's so of my era and, and I so appreciated his work, is they're having a tribute to Billy D. Williams. Yes. Uh, and they're also screening Lady Sings the Blues, of course, which is, was his 1972 hit with Diana Ross. Yes. Such a great movie. And it left such an impression on me as a kid, that movie. You know, I thought, is that what it's like to be an artist? You have to suffer like that yeah. to, <laughs> to really make it. But I think he's such an underappreciated actor. And I'm so excited to see the conversation they have with him. Yes. Because, of course, he's gone on to be such an icon. He's, and he's gone on to make so many great movies. It'll be really fun to see what he has to say. And he's going to be signing uh, copies of his book. So if you're attending, you'll be able to buy that as well. I think we should cover a couple of things. Yeah. I think we should cover movies that are being played at the festival that you and I have never seen and yes. cannot wait to see. Yes, there's, I, have, I have a list. There's so many great ones. And then a list of the movies that we have seen, but that we could watch <laughs> over and over again, just oh, to give yes. people a flavor of what the festival is about. Yeah, but first, before we do that, yeah. Can we just kind of give a shout out to the people attending? Yes, yes, the yes, yes. The special yes. guest they have lined up is amazing. Okay. They have, um, you know, uh, we already mentioned John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson and Uma Thurman there for uh, Jodie Foster. Jody Foster. But also they've, they've got Jeff Daniels and Dana Delaney and Morgan Freeman and Diane Lane, Tim Robbins, uh, Keith Carradine, my buddy. Uh, and also journalist Scott Feinberg. Yes, I know you're a big I'm, fan. I'm, I'm in love with Scott Feinberg. And Leonard Maltin will be there. And the filmmakers they have lined up is spectacular. They've got David Fincher, Carl Franklin, John Landis, Nancy Myers, Mike Newell, Alexander Payne, and Mr. Spielberg. I, I mean, I, I'm speechless. <laughs> I, I mean, just having him there. Yes. And what a... What an advocate he has become, and really has been his whole career yes. for, for the restoration of films, but specifically for TCM, because last yes. June they had a lot of layoffs, and he and a couple of other filmmakers, oh, I think it might have been Martin Scorsese, we got to get behind this, and we got to help curate these films and keep this alive, because yeah. it's the history of this industry. I love that they saw the importance and they stepped up. I do too. I do too.
let's talk about the films that we've never seen that we're excited to see at the festival that we'll be screening. Oh, you, good, you go good, good. Well, you know, the, the one that pops into my head first and foremost yeah. is The Big House. Oh. Um, they're showing, I guess it's a restored print of it from 1930. I've never seen it. Okay. Um, it's director George Hill, who, of course, he, he you know directed Men and Bill and, you know, tons of stuff. It's written by Frances Marion, who I think we've talked about on the podcast before. She was probably the most prolific and highest paid writer in Hollywood for a while. And they were married. Oh, wow. uh, George Hill and Frances Marion were husband and wife okay. and they made The Big House. Frances Marion, people probably know, you know, she won an Oscar for this movie, The Big House. Uh, but we know her from, she wrote The Champ and Dinner at mm. Eight and Anna Christie and Camille. I mean, yes. she w just was one of the best screenwriters we've ever had in this industry. Yeah. Uh, but the movie, it stars Robert Montgomery and Chester Morris and Wallace Beery, who I love yes, so much. Me too. And it was probably the very first um, prison picture. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, they really defined the genre of the prison picture in the big house. Wow. Um, and it's, you know, it's about these three men who are in prison on varying degrees of guilt <laughs> and uh, brutalness. And it's just about their life behind bars. And I can't wait to see it. I'm so excited. Um, and yeah, that's probably the first and foremost for me. Okay. I had so many. Yes. I, I really did. It was hard to kind of call it down, but let me just throw one out. The Good Fairy. Yeah, I've never seen it either. Now, The Good Fairy, it's from 1935, and it's directed by William Wyler, and his son, David Wyler, is going to be at the screening yes. and uh, part of a Q&A Very afterward. cool. And one of the things, because I thought, well, William Wyler, you would think we would have seen this film, but apparently, according to TCM's website, it is <laughs> one of his least seen films. And, and I think he got fired off this film. Oh. I think. If I'm not mistaken, I think if Preston Sturgis wrote it and he directed Preston Sturgis it, Sturgis wrote it. They both kind of got fired from this film. Well, well, one of the things they talk about is the continual arguments on set. <laughs> now, part of that is between Wyler and the star Margaret Sullivan, who we've talked about in this podcast before on our, I believe it was our New Year's yes. films episode. Uh, the Moon's Our Home from 1936 that she starred in with Henry Fonda, who she actually ended up marrying, and they were... And speaking of marrying... Yeah, and she ends up marrying William Wyler. <laughs> so, so apparently all that fighting was maybe love fights. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> well, the story of the good fairy, it follows the life of an orphan played by Margaret Sullivan. And my understanding is that she sees this world as a fantasy. Um, so she, her innocence, her, her looking at everything through rose colored glasses yes. gets her in trouble with men, which <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Naivete. <laughs> right. And so as you can imagine, I'm imagining hijinks ensue. Um, but it does say that the production was a nightmare. <laughs> Sturgis was apparently rewriting yes. and handing out script you know, pages and new scenes all the time. I read that. And they, and Weiler and Sullivan, were <laughs> quarreling all the time until they then ran off and got married. Yes. Well, which is how, of, about, how about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess they did, Universal Pictures did fire not only William Weiler, but Sturges yeah, as well. I think they both got the boot. I, I, I think I read that. Yeah, so I'm looking wow, forward to that. Wow, that must have been a pretty disorderly set. <laughs> well, and just seeing the film with that backdrop, knowing the behind the scenes, I think it'd be interesting to see what what the, sparks fly. The making of. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. your movie. Um, well, my, my next film, and I'm really excited to see it, it's The Night Has 1,000 Eyes. Oh, yes. From 1948. It's directed by John Farrow, as we all know, is um, Mia Farrow's father, uh -huh. Maureen O'Sullivan's husband. You know, a very prolific director. I, you know, I don't think he was ever an A-plus director, but he did some great things like Bill of Divorcement with Catherine Hepburn, mm. The Big Clock. You know, he did some great stuff. Uh, but this particular movie intrigues me for a couple of reasons. One, it stars Edward G. Robinson, who is one of my absolute favorite actors. He can do no wrong in my book. <laughs> but it also stars the beautiful and tragic Gail Russell. Oh, yes. And well, we've talked about and we've talked, And I think we're going to do an episode about Gail Russell and, and her sort of tragic life. But I've, I've been such a fan of hers ever since I saw her as a kid. 
um, in The Angel and the Bad Man with John Wayne. She plays this young, innocent Quaker girl who shows this gunslinger the ways of love and peace. But anyway, she's so exquisite and she's, I mean, I, I can't even describe her beauty. It's like otherworldly. Mm -hmm. and, and she really was a wonderful actress as well. And it's just really sad. You know, she was this vulnerable, you know, insecure person that, that probably was not made for a career in Hollywood. But she had a powerful stage mother who pushed her in front of the cameras. And she had Paramount Pictures who saw money in her. So they were pushing her. And it just, it didn't end well for her. But yeah. I, I'm such a fan of hers. But anyway, I'm excited for that. But um, the story itself is right up my alley too, because it's about um, Edward G. Robinson plays this phony psychic. And you know me, I love a phony psychic. <laughs> Uh, he's built himself. Yeah, really? he, he's he builds himself as the mental wizard. Well, something happens, and he actually gets real psychic I'm powers. Reading that, yes. And he, you know, he actually sees some horrible things in his own life that he can't prevent. So he sort of goes into seclusion. But then, when his grown daughter, played by Gail Russell, when he gets a vision of her in peril, he comes out of hiding and he goes to help her. So, you know, it's a real film noir kind of feel kind to of it. kind of whimsical, it sounds. Yes, yeah. yes. And it just sounds incredible. And, you know, with the two of them in the lead, like, I'm all over yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And also stars John Lund, who I really appreciate, and Virginia Bruce, who I'm a big fan of. Well, I'm going to add that to my list yeah. as well. Okay, let me throw one more at, at you. Oh, my gosh. We love Thelma Ritter uh, in this podcast. Yes. And who doesn't love Thelma Ritter? The Model and <sighs> the Marriage Broker which I can't kind of believe I like, haven't seen. I it. cannot believe you haven't seen that yeah, movie. Yeah, because I know yeah. you have oh, seen it. I love it. I know movie. how much you love her. I love it. I was surprised to learn that it's her only starring role. Yeah. But she received third billing because, of course, she's not your typical, at least in the time frame that we're yeah. talking about, your typical leading woman. So Jean Crane and Scott Brady. Who, who we've talked about when we talked about siblings yeah, the a sibling few episodes ago. rivalry episode, who is a brother to Lawrence Tierney. Um, they are uh, first and second billing. But Thelma Ritter apparently steals <laughs> this movie. Yes, indeed. Every scene she's in, she plays a <laughs> marriage broker. And Crane, who co-stars is a model who's stuck in a, a dead-end romance and so Thelma Ritter helps her find her perfect man. What's interesting is writer-producer Charles Brackett apparently loved Thelma Ritter so much in the mating season from 1951 yes, great one. that he wrote this as a vehicle for her. Um, and again, it's uh, directed by another iconic person, George Cukor. Yes. And it's from 1951. You know, if I were to ever get a marriage broker, I would want it to be Thelma Ritter. I would too. <laughs> I would too. And there's another film I want to talk about when we get to the ones that we, oh, good. That we can't, we would watch over and over again. And she's in that one as Perfect. well. So we've got a lot more films to talk about, but right now let's jump into this week's Hollywood pop quiz. And the pop quiz question today is, at the very first Turner Classic Movie Film Festival, Ooh. who was the star who received their handprints in cement during the festival? Oh, do, 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 do. I love that question. Ah. We'll be back with the answer and more films and details about Turner Classic Movie Film Festival after this. All right, Steve and Ann will be right back, but first another stop on the Hollywood tour. Maybe one of the single sweetest films from the golden age of Hollywood is Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. That came out, of course, in 1946. And one of the sweetest TV shows ever? Well, that would have to be Sesame Street, right? So what do these have to do with each other? Well, believe it or not, the beloved characters of Bert and Ernie on Sesame Street were actually named after Bert the Cop and Ernie the Taxi Driver in It's a Wonderful Life. And now back to Steve and Ann from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Welcome back, everybody. Nan and I are finishing up our list of movies that we're dying to see at the Turner Classic Film Festival that we haven't seen. Yes. And the next one on my list, it's um, The Prisoner of Shark Island. I saw that on the list, and it was on my list as well. What a, what a title. Yeah. 1936. Um, it's directed by the great John Ford, of course, who gave us Stagecoach and The Grapes of Wrath and How Green Was My Valley and The Quiet Man and all those John Wayne westerns. Uh, but it stars Warner Baxter, 
who of course won the very second best actor Oscar in 1929 for In Old Arizona. Uh, it also stars Gloria Stewart, who mm. most people know from Titanic, yes. but she actually had a whole big career before right, Titanic. She did. she did. <laughs> and the best part is it has all of John Ford's stock players in it. John Carradine, Harry Carey, Francis oh, wow. Ford, who was his brother, yes. John uh, McGuire, Paul Fix, all the great yep. John Ford stock characters there in this movie. Uh, I'm really excited to see this movie because it's being introduced by John Carradine's son, Keith Carradine, yes. who's an old pal of mine, yes. and I haven't seen Keith in a long, long time, and I'm really looking forward to reconnecting with him, but yeah. Keith ended up starring in one of the first movies I ever produced, uh, our very own, which also starred Alice and Janney, and he's such an exquisite actor and such a lovely human being, I can't wait to see him, uh, but the movie just sounds good great. I mean, it really hooked me from the, the you know, I read the log line of what it's about. Yeah. And it's, it's about this doctor who, you know, hours after Abraham Lincoln is assassinated, he um, unknowingly helps patch up John Wilkes Booth. He doesn't know yes. what's gone on. Well, he ends up getting arrested and sentenced for being uh, an accomplice and aiding an assassin. So he goes to prison, probably unfairly, and it's all about his time in prison and what he does with his medical knowledge that helps the prison system. And it just sounds like a really yeah. great movie. And I'm really excited to see it. That sounds really interesting. And it's a, it's a great segue into the last one on my list because I wonder how John Ford would have felt about this movie. Ah. It's, sort of, it's sort of in his wheelhouse. Sort of. <laughs> it's called well, maybe not the female part Maybe not of it. the female part <laughs> yeah, of it, yeah. But yes. It's called Westward <laughs> the Women. It's from 1951, directed by William Wellman, who we all know from yes. A Star is Born. Yes. He actually wrote the original uh, screenplay for that. He directed one of your favorite films. The Oxbow Incident. The Oxbow yes. Incident I was just from 1942. Say, yes. And he's also directed a fair number of um who we would consider really strong, wonderful, leading ladies. So it's no surprise that he, he would direct a Western <laughs> about women taking over a wagon train. Isn't that a great concept? It's such a great concept. I can't believe I haven't ever heard of it I know. or seen it. I've never heard of it or seen it. I, I can't wait. And one of the things that's really interesting about it is that apparently Wellman, the director, actually put the actresses through training. Now, <laughs> nowadays we would say, well, like of course. Like wagon train training? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you hear about actors all the time going to, you know. Uh, Army camp. Exactly, or, yeah. or whatever it is, you know, Tom Cruise <laughs> with Top Gun and going to, right. you know, flight school and all of that. But he put them through pioneer skills to learn, <laughs> I don't know what those would be, I guess, Churning butter? Or I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what it would be, but, but anyway, chopping wood, yes. I know, driving horses, I don't know. Yeah, so anyway, it, it looks like a wonderful film uh, featuring... I was going to uh, say, who are the women? I'm dying. Denise Darcel and oh, Hope yeah. Emerson. That, those are the leads. I love Hope um, Emerson. Robert Taylor plays the wagon master. Love him. So um, those are the those are the main uh, folks in it. But I love that the ads for the film called it because it's this pioneer adventure and they're on a wagon train, <laughs> an adventure that most men feared to Ooh, face. Wow, great so log I have line. This is going to be a real female empowerment kind of a film, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I think we should talk about films that we've seen before that are playing at the festival, but that we consider films we could watch over and over Ugh. and over again, no matter how many times. That's my favorite part. I mean, <laughs> so, they're showing so many movies that I absolutely am obsessed with, and yes. I can't wait to see them on the big screen. I was going to say, not only on the big screen, but many of them are either remastered or... Yes. You know, a, a new um, nitrate print exactly. or exactly. Yeah. So it's going to be some amazing viewing. Yes. You, you go first. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, sort of keeping with the theme of the festival about, you know, police and justice and crime, my number one has got to be um, Double Indemnity. Oh, yeah. You know, we all know that great Billy Wilder movie with Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray and Edward G. Robinson, my man, you know, and it just tells the, the classic tale of the, um, the insurance man and the, the uh, unhappy wife who decide to 
off the husband for the yes. insurance money and how the very you know uh, intrepid insurance guy Edward G. Robinson is on the trail of them. It's just a, a film noir classic, yep. and I think most people have probably seen it, but I've never seen it on the big screen. I think that would be pretty so thrilling. I'm very excited about that, and um, I, I don't know if I've said this on the podcast before, but um, the house they use for Barbara Stanwyck's house with Tom Powers yeah. um, is actually around the corner from me. Oh, wow. So I always walk Myrna by the old double indemnity house. Oh, so, that's very cool. Yeah. All right. On my list is sort of along the same lines, Rear Window. Ah, yes. 1954, Alfred Hitchcock. I love what, what TCM says about it. It's a murder mystery. It's a love story. It's a dark comedy, which it really is. All three of those <laughs> all things. All three of those and I things. I think that's why I love it so much. Yeah. Of course, the plot is Jimmy Stewart is a photographer. He's broken his leg. He's in a wheelchair. He's recuperating, spying on his neighbors. I and, mean, and really. Who wouldn't? That's, I mean, that's who the wouldn't? Way to say it. You've and, got a broken leg. You're in a cast. Yeah, you're bored. You're You've bored, got binoculars. You're in your wheelchair, <laughs> and you have a beautiful view out out your yes. window of all your neighbors, <laughs> and your neighbors are. An interesting collection of people yes and not only is the <laughs> central neighbor that creates the thrilling um murder and intrigue yeah exactly but all the other neighbors around them you know the miss the, lonely heart miss lonely Hearts. she's my favorite <laughs> yes and the dancer yes and, you know all of those so um his fashion model girlfriend who is played to perfection by perfection. grace kelly and not only is she playing it to perfection, but everything she wears, designed by Edith, Edith Head, Head yep. you just want to grab it and put it in your in your um, closet. Wendell Corey plays uh, a supporting role. We love role. Wendell Corey. Yes, and of course, the bad guy is Raymond Burr. So it's it's just one of those stories that when it is on yes. the television, I can't stop. I have to watch it, um, and. As we mentioned her before, we have to mention her again. <laughs> His visiting nurse is played by Thelma Ritter, who is sarcasm and sardonic yes. wit at its finest. I think she's that comic relief they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's she's it's, so great. It's really, really beautifully done, and uh, one of my favorite Hitchcock films. Yes, me too. And I've never seen it on the big screen, so that's exciting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What What do you have? Uh, you know, I've got two films, and they're kind of definitely in the theme of the. Again, the theme of the show, they're all about cops and robbers and justice and police. And one is the Asphalt Jungle from 1950. Yeah. John Huston with, with Sterling Hayden and Gene Hagen and Louis Calhoun and James Whitmore and Sam Jaffe. Such an incredible movie about um, a heist that goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's such a great character study in, um, you know, people that why they do things and, and and what gets them to a point in life where they have to do things illegal and it, it's just this beautiful story of a little redemption mm -hmm. but but um you know it's gritty and it's dark and it's everything i love in a movie and it's so <laughs> narratively perfect i i can't wait to see that one on the big screen okay because uh, i've never seen it and also the big heat yeah this we've one talked about that before. oh this one has a special place in my heart because it's the first movie i can remember i think i've mentioned that you know i used to stay up really late way past my bedtime watching old movies with my dad who would let me and this was one of the first movies we ever saw together it was the big heat and um, it was 1953 with the great fritz lang of course it stars glenn ford and gloria graham and alexander scurby jocelyn brando the sister of marlon brando yes. and then lee marvin and jeanette nolan but it's just it's about this police detective whose wife is spoiler alert she's killed in a bombing attack that was meant for him and it sends him off the deep end he becomes this unhinged warrior for revenge against the people that killed his wife which leads to basically the the small quiet town that they live in it's being controlled by mobsters okay and so glenn ford has to take down the mobsters and along the way he picks up the mobsters gal gloria graham and she gets and you know she's the graham. bad girl who ends up being a good girl and it's just one of the most perfect movies i've ever seen and i cannot wait to see that one on the big screen yeah all right let me throw two at you really quick good one which you are going to be surprised i think oh in cold blood 
You've never seen no, in cold. Oh, this is the one. Oh, this is the one. Okay, I was gonna say I thought we're in the wrong category. Okay, all right. Oh no, I, it was on my list, but I, I knocked oh, okay. it. Okay, yeah. you knocked it off. I wouldn't okay. call that. <laughs> I mean, I remember watching it as a kid. And chilling. It was so chilling. Ugh. I think I also wasn't used to seeing black and white films, especially it's a later film to yeah. be in black and white, but it was done that way on purpose. And the way they shot it makes you think it's a documentary. It, oh. That's what's so chilling yes. to me. And yes. And they, they cast at the time two actors who were not well known. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there's so much about it that is just a gritty realism. Of course, those two actors are Robert Blake and Scott Wilson. Yeah. It's the story of the Clutter family who were randomly murdered by two young men. Richard Brooks directed Elmer Gantry and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and he was also a producer as well. And he directs, looking at this real life murder mm -hmm. taking place in Kansas City, Truman Capote, obviously, yes. based on his book, wrote, wrote the screenplay. It is, you cannot take your eyes off it. The cinematography is by Conrad Hall, who is- Yeah, the great Conrad the Hall. Great. And Quincy Jones yes. does the score. In complete contrast to that, to just wrap this up, The Little Foxes. Oh. Because we've talked I about- I love that movie. Yeah, we've talked about Lillian Hellman. Who doesn't love Betty Davis? I know. In one of her most sinister and dark yes. roles. Um, and, you know, not to give anything away, but that final scene oh. is pretty chilling. And Teresa Wright. Oh, and Teresa who Wright. Who holds her own She's admirably against fantastic. Betty Davis. Fantastic, yes. And actually, I think that was, I think The Little Foxes was, Teresa Wright started her career and she got Oscar nominated for her first three films yes. out the bat. And yeah. I think Little Foxes was the third of she three. She did get nominated yeah. as well as Betty yeah. Davis. Actually, it's a very highly um, uh, nominated film. Um, multiple Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, Best Score by Meredith Wilson, who yes. wrote The Music <laughs> Man. A little um, different for him. Screenplay by Lillian Hellman. She also was nominated. And as we said, Betty Davis and Teresa Wright. But it has all the elements of a wonderful Southern yes. dark family embezzlement and Betrayal blackmail and... and ultimately murder. Have you? And I just watched this recently. Have you seen the, um, the prequel? Another part of the forest. I have it on the DVR. Okay. It, yeah. It, you know, after you watch Little Foxes, I think you should definitely go watch because you really get to see these characters when they were younger. Yeah. And you see how everything was set in place yes. from an early age, why they ended up the way they did in the Little Foxes. I wish we yeah. could do a theater production with multiple with yes. both both shows. That'd and, be really yeah, clever. It would be really cool. Just to give them their due, William Wyler directed it, and Greg Toland, another yeah. iconic cinematographer. And uh, yeah, I just really kind of can't uh, take my eyes off of it. It's, a, it's <laughs> Betty Davis's third film with William Wyler. Yeah, that's right. Apparently, they fought a lot, but maybe that's why it was so good. I, I don't think know. Wyler fought with a lot of people. Then he yeah. married them. So yeah. <laughs> did he marry Betty? <laughs> Well, this is going to be the most exciting four days. Yes. I can't wait. I think it's time for the answer to our Hollywood pop quiz. The question of the day was, at the very first Turner Classic Film Festival, who was the star who got their handprints in cement at Grauman's Chinese Theater? Now, it was 15 years ago? It was 15, 2010. Okay. And it's, um, I don't know, it might, might stump you. I'm, okay, I'm going to just let you give right. me the answer then. The answer is Mel Brooks. Wow, mm, I never when, would have guessed that. That's when Mel Brooks finally got his handprints oh, in cement. Good. So good old TCM for well, making that happen. If you want more information about the festival, check out TCM's website, tcm.com. And more than that, we would appreciate it if you would follow us on social media. Our handle is at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. We're on YouTube. You can watch the show as well as on Instagram and Facebook. And we'd love to hear from you. You can always email us at info at From Beneath the Hollywood Sign dot com. That's this week's view. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review. And tell your friends about us, too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara. Executive producer and post-production supervisor, Lindsay Schnell. 
only. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schneebly and Toth. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. That's a wrap. Thank you.